Marianne, thank you very much for accepting to take part to the series called Breakfast at Kuzna. Yeah. This is not the first time we meet. Last no. time we were talking yeah. about sand clay and how the symbol of the unconscious comes through mm -hmm. sand clay. Today I would like a few questions which are the usual question I, I mm -hmm. ask. The first one would be, who was Carl Gustav Jung? Mm -hmm. So, I think he was a very talented and courageous man who dared to uh, have his own ideas, but these ideas were based on his experiences with psychopathological patients at the Burkölzli, at this famous psychiatric clinic in Zurich, uh, where he worked as a doctor, medical doctor and psychiatrist. And he um, had to sacrifice his friendship with Freud, who was a kind of father for him, and he was a kind in a kind of son status. And when he was um, developing his own material, and this is, I, I uh, think, uh, uh, of the collective unconscious, uh, he knew that Freud never would accept it. And so he was very anxious first to uh, um, public his thoughts and yeah, because he had the fear that Freud would break with him and it was like this. So he was very courageous at the end and fortunately for us uh, because uh, he published his thoughts about the collective unconscious and the archetypes which are the resource for creative energy and for new life, which gives such a lot of hope and possibility for people who perhaps were not so lucky in their private life with their concrete personal parents and not only the parents, perhaps the whole environment was not very lucky for this uh, person and when she makes an analysis later and deals with the, her problems, his or her problems, um, there can be found new possibilities that were hidden, that the person never uh, experienced before and so very new aspects can come into the life of a person so that the person can overgrow uh, wounds for example of the childhood or also from later times of puberty especially it's a very vulnerable phase and um, also yeah who is your own Jung? When did you meet Jung? Obviously not in person. When did you decide to become a Jungian analyst? Yeah, so this I decided rather young. Uh, I was 17 and I struggled with a teacher and I was the class speaker. We had a very uh, difficult um, literature uh, teacher who was not nice with my classmates and I had to defend them and as a class speaker and but I had to make the bridge between this difficult teacher and my classmates. I wanted to bring away the tensions and understand what happens and so I went to a lecture of a union analyst uh, which was given in the in the school for teachers and for parents 
And I thought this is an opportunity for me to know more. Uh, it was about um, psychology and education. And I thought this is sounds very interesting, I will go. And so I was there, I was the only young person <laughs> and I was so interested in it that I asked the lecturer how can I uh, know more about this interesting man. And he said the most um, simple thing is to make an own analysis because then you can uh, experience it from inside. And I immediately did it. Uh, of course, I had to ask my parents if they would pay it for me. And they agreed, fortunately, and said when it's important for me, they, they would pay it. And I so I gave my only free afternoon I had. It was Wednesday afternoon and went into another city where this uh, um, therapist or Jungian analyst was working and had his own private practice. And this I did for a year, for a whole year, and I was very enthusiastic. And I also began to change a lot. So first I went because of curiosity, but then it happened that I really began to uh, deal with my unconscious and I already began to experience uh, the difference between personal unconscious and uh, the collective. And so, yeah, I was caught by, by you. Of course, um, I yeah, I, I spoke about uh, the, these, uh, uh, the, the, the idea of becoming a Jungian analyst later when I was more mature and adult and uh, the, this Jungian analyst encouraged me. He said that he has the impression that I um, uh, correspond very positively with this kind of uh, psychology. And I had also this impression. And so I knew when I'm older and more major, I will go to the Jung Institute. But first I studied German literature, philosophy and art. And fortunately, at the same time, when I went uh, to this lecture, when I was 17 and so knew first of Jung, I, uh, at the same time I um, acquainted Jung uh, by uh, one of our teachers who was a very good woman. Uh, she taught us pedagogic and philosophy. And she uh, made us um, familiar with Jung, with Freud, with Adler, uh, with Immanuel Kant, with other famous people. And so I began to read uh, these philosophers, these psychologists, and in a very young age. And at the same time I had the, the concrete personal experience in an analysis. I rejoice that you mentioned Adler because is is not often mentioned nowadays, yeah. but it's fundamental, I think, the three of them. It's the very world. important also. You see it in the whole world when you look at people with an inferior complex, they very often have a tendency to become powerful. To compensate. To yes. compensate. And this was the main thought of Adler. Yeah. He was also originally a a pupil of, of Freud and then he had his own ideas and Freud had unfortunately the tendency to cut off his best people. Yeah, because he wanted to have very uh, a kind of family which 
is uh, very close to him in, in their thoughts. But these pupils, Adler, Freud, Jung and others began to, uh, to, to, to go their own way. And this is what they had to do because of the uh, individuation. Everybody has to become what uh, he is thought for. Can you say something more about individuation, which is a term, a terminology very important for Jung, the process mm -hmm. of individuation? Jung didn't invent, it's not coming from Jung, it's coming from others. But what is Jung concept or process of individuation? Yeah, uh, individuation in a Jungian sense is to become as as um, uh, whole as possible, but in the right sense. Uh, wholeness is connected to to the real life. So. We all have a kind of uh, false self. We develop, develop this during growing up because we have to adapt to parents, to siblings, to school, and later to, to, to the boss and to the environment of university and or when we have a, a job to the boss and, and the other environment. So we have a lot to do uh, with adaption and this can lead us away from ourselves. And the, we have a term which is well known from Winnicott, the real self, and Jung meant the same, he had other terms for it. Uh, not these uh, very famous terms like from Winnicott, but uh, he meant the same thing, that we should come to ourselves more and more and find our real talents and real personality more and more. And this needs a courage. He somewhere says that people want to make an analysis to learn more of themselves, but very often they are too anxious. He, he has the the image of a dog who wants to become clean but is doesn't like the water. Yeah? So it needs a courage to meet yourself, to meet your unknown um, features and parts of personality which are partially uh, repressed when they belong to the personal unconscious. These are experiences which were hurtful, painful or sometimes also very positive but you don't think that they belong to you. So uh, the darker and lighter aspects belong to the shadow. This means are unconscious. And when you don't have these aspects in your life, in your conscious life, you are very rigid. What is the shadow? The shadow is in the personal unconscious in one, on one hand, but it can also be in the collective shadow, in the collective level. So, uh, the personal shadow comes is, is, a, is a result of personal experiences and when we want to in individuate we have to confront ourselves with this personal shadow which we can see very nicely in our dreams but it comes also out in paintings and in sand play of course um, so and when we begin to deal with this shadowy aspect, we begin to um, integrate the shadow. We take back our projections on other person. Uh, and these pro projections of the shadow can be that we have very bad thoughts about other, think this is a, um, a bad person or... Uh, um, 
not a talented person or something like this. And but perhaps we are this by ourselves. And when we know this, we are much more relaxed. But also when we project a very idealistic uh, features, for example, courage, um, um, creativity, and these kinds of uh, traits, when we project this on others, then we forget that we can do this ourselves. And when we begin to take back these projections and dare to be co courageous ourselves and being creative ourselves, and this means we trust ourselves more, uh, then we become more whole. You mm -hmm. said the first step of individuation or the first part of the mm -hmm. analysis mm -hmm. is to meet your shadow. Mm -hmm. What is the second step? Ah, oh, the second step. So these are a little bit artificial steps because they are, uh, yeah. These these steps are. They they are interchanging in a way, but the shadow is always important. Uh, of course, very often you are firstly confronted with it, but you begin also uh, in the very beginning many of my clients uh, begin uh, also to come in contact very quickly with something which looks like the self. Yeah, very quickly there is some collective level already there which gives hope. In many initial dreams I find this that there are also in initial sand trays which have a similar quality to initial dreams, that uh, close to the shadow aspects uh, are also hopeful images which gives hope for, for aims in the development. You talked about Anima yeah. and Animus. Mm -hmm. What are those? What is the Anima? What is the Animus? Ah, yeah, yeah. So I think this is also something which can be very thankful towards nowadays, towards Jung, because when he lived, there were very rigid. Uh, roles of females and males and by coming to these concepts these are archetypes very important archetypes uh, which so perhaps I say what he thought what animus anima is and then what animus is he uh, came into contact with his own anima. Um, he was forced to come in contact. It was not uh, something, it was not like a play or a thought or so. He was forced because of his unconscious material and because of he, the, the very important uh, experiences with female figures he did, with Emma Jung, with Tony Wolf and others, with Spielrein, and uh, he felt the power of the feminine. He already felt this power when he was a child. Uh, we can read it in, the, in this uh, famous book when he was an old man. And so he began to, to ser search uh, about this uh, phenomenon and he began to detect that this is a very important, the anima is an important autonomous kind of energy in him, uh, it's an archetype, with which he began to come into contact and uh, 
speaking with her, asking her, what do you want, who are you, what do you mean, and so on. So he began to build up a real relationship inside of his psyche. And he detected that when a man like him and others, also clients of him, begin to deal with the inner female, they come more close to themselves. So he began to see that in one hand, when you deal with the inner anima, uh, you come more close to your own self. And this is what is meant with individuation, when I make the bridge to your other question you had before. And the effect of such a um, cultivation uh, of the own anima uh, is very positive in the relationship regarding the relationship with the females in the outer world. So he began to detect and experience that he can much better deal with women. He, be he began to understand women better. So his ability to put himself into relationships uh, was growing. And also with men, of course. Because when you deal with your anima, you also deal with all other aspects of unconscious aspects. And so dealing for a man, when he is dealing with his anima seriously, then he becomes more female. He is no more the one-sided man, this patriarchal man or... Sometimes you find it uh, in uh, southern cultures, uh, Italian or Spanish cultures or so, where the man has, is like a, a little bit kind, a, a kind of macho. Uh, it's a little bit one-sided, but inside, very insecure, very often, regarding emotions and, and females. And so he has to to pretend to be very male and very strong, yeah? And many men are so, also in Switzerland, in Germany, in all countries, before they begin really to detect their female parts. And it's not easy for a man to develop his female attitudes because the collective uh, roles pretend a man has to be strong, cool, uh, and so on. Uh, he has to uh, he has to be a good fighter, uh, and so on. Yeah, ty typical female uh, features. But the man is not only this, and when he stucks in this role or in these features, then he is one-sided. And he can fall in a very deep depression, especially when he is dealing with relationships, he has his crisis, he isn't able to deal with it. And the same is with the, uh, happens with the female, uh, he, female humans. When we, uh, as when uh, women, don't develop their inner male parts. Which doesn't only mean develop aggressivity. Actually, the additional question will you: what is the other way around? What is the animus for women, especially in a 21st century society yeah. where finally yeah. women don't have to stay home? as in a patriarchal society, yeah, yeah, yeah. although we are still in a patriarchal yeah, yeah. society, mm -hmm. where women can have a job, can mm -hmm. study, can yeah. learn. I'm a father of three daughters. But then how do emotion work in this new negotiation of roles in the couple? Yeah. Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. I had a patient 
mm -hmm. who came to me at age was around 30. She came in saying, I have nightmares. Mm -hmm. I, have a I am a lesbian. Mm -hmm. I have a partner, a female partner. But every night I dream of having sex with a man. The person was female and said she is a lesbian and has a, lesb a, a, a female partner, yes. but she is dreaming having sex with a man. So her question, her anxiety was, mm -hmm. am I heterosexual? Mm -hmm. What is going on? Mm -hmm. For me, it's very, it was very interesting that initial dream, and it said, the therapy said how to work together to investigate what was behind. Yeah. So I think these anima anima parts uh, uh, are insofar very important if they not only are very important for heterosexual people but also for homosexual people. It doesn't matter if you are homosexual or heterosexual but when you are one-sided in one attitude when you are either too female, uh, too adapting, too strongly in the emotions and so on, when you are one-sided female, and or when you are one-sided male, and you can be both as a... It has to do something with the gender. Gender and sex is not the same. Yeah? You can be... So the question I would put on regarding your example is, is this uh, woman, is she too strongly identified with the mother complex and is the male part too far away and is she, in what kind of relationship is she, is this woman also very strongly female or is she very male uh, so then she is when she is very male she is searching for the male part and perhaps a, a, a woman who is very male because she's very strongly uh, like this because of her nature or by a, a too strong identification with the father but it can be both. She can be really more male uh, as a personality. We have a lot of different shades in the in the sex, and uh, we can look like a woman, but can be very male. And it's all this this whole transgender uh, uh, theme also. But in your case, uh, of your patients. It's very important to look what is she missing, what is her psyche missing. And when she needs uh, being in contact, in the intimate contact with in, in, the, in the image with a man, it means she needs to come in contact with her animus, at least. <laughs> the inner animus. And we don't know about the development of this woman, perhaps she only thinks she is homosexual and but in fact she will develop to a heterosexual woman as soon as she begins to become more whole and become, becomes to develop her own um, male parts and so Perhaps the in in this case you nodded when I asked what kind of type is this female part par, uh, partner. You said she is really uh, quite male, and perhaps this I would even say patriarchal. Patriarchal, the patriarchal. The partner uh, that was the breadwinner was very demanding, always away for a job, yeah. and the patient was asked to do tasks that a woman mm -hmm. in the patriarchal society. Yeah, yeah. 
is, and this is part of the struggle. The mm -hmm. second part of the struggle is the lack of communication, mm -hmm. the lack of conversation. Mm -hmm. Third, I would say she would identify with the father, a weak father, mm -hmm. who possibly had, had a history of homosexuality, repressed homosexuality, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and a strong mother, mm -hmm. over controlling. Yeah, dominant, oh, animus yeah. possessed, perhaps. Yes. Uh, perhaps a weak father with what was anima, anima possessed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, it's very difficult sometimes to develop all parts and perhaps this this partner now is is so i i can't really more closely discuss about this this um, concrete uh, example but perhaps i can imagine that because i had such cases too in analysis that this is a transitional uh, uh, Dream. partner, mm -hmm. perhaps she begins to develop when she becomes more whole. She bega begin to change her choices, choices for partnership. Perhaps it will be a man. Perhaps not. We don't know how she develops. Perhaps she is a real lesbian uh, woman and then she prefers women, really. But perhaps she will change the partner if she is a real lesbian and needs a, um, a, a good re relationship where emotions have enough space and then either she will have a feminine male partner who is very good uh, connected with his emotions or she will have a nicer, warmer, more feminine lesbian partner. Yeah. Yeah, perhaps the point is to get in contact with, with oneself. Yeah, with, with oneself. Self, yeah. Which is portrayed in the dream, yeah, making yeah. love with the yeah, yeah, man. Yeah. It's not about who your partner, what sex is your partner going to be, a man, a woman, mm -hmm. bisexual. Mm -hmm. Not interested in this, but it's really to find a space for comfort where she could develop, yeah. both personally, professionally. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting, <clears throat> and you know my interest of contemporary sociology about post-gender, post-biblical, post-class society. Yeah. But also, where do we put the emotion? I remember she said, "I struggle with my partner that is so demanding, so controlling." so patriarchal somehow, and I miss my kitchen. I feel good in my kitchen. Mm -hmm. I want to cook, mm -hmm. I want to cook the specialty for my country, but at the same time, I struggle. Because wow. my identity is not just being in the kitchen. Uh -huh, yeah. So it's yeah. really a request for development. Yes, it's From, a... you said, the collective society, what mm -hmm. society for thousands of years mm -hmm. has said a man and a woman should be, mm -hmm. and new categories. Mm -hmm. And I truly think that we are still in transition. Mm -hmm. It's too easy, too fast, too quick yeah. to say, well, new women are like this, new men are like this. Mm -hmm. I think Andrew Sandler is very good in portraying the new father. Yeah. But again, there is to be a conversation within the couple mm -hmm. of whatever sex, yeah. as he says. Yeah. Yes, of course. And I think uh, sex is related to the feelings also very strongly and when the feelings yeah when this is connected and the problems are also connected yeah and I think uh, the personal development uh, is very important in, in, in every kind of partnership as soon as it's no more possible to develop in a way that uh, you let behind old features, that you can open new possibilities and becoming more uh, rich in your whole personality. When, as soon as this is no more possible, uh, we should ask why? ourselves, why is it, is my partner 
blocking me? Can we, how can we deal with it? Or am I myself blocking me? And at the end, we can use this anima, anima concept very creative to develop our missing parts to become more strong, autonomous and um, either we are male or female, we have to develop our missing parts. And in the tendency, women collectif collectively seen uh, have more a lack of uh, strong masculine masculinity and have to develop these animus parts. But not all women. It depends on which whom of your parents you you um, identify more. So when you have a very weak father, like this patient in, in your case, uh, and uh, but perhaps a nice father, perhaps uh, he is more close with her feelings to him, then perhaps she identified more with him. And because she had not nice feelings with her mother, who was so dominant and animus possessed. But it, I could imagine, imagine in this case, it's only a hypothesis, she, when she was more identified with a female weak father, as she describes him, uh, who is more close to feelings, to female attitudes, to female talents, uh, like cooking perhaps, uh, then she is searching for the other part, for the male part, but in the figure of a woman. And she then she is dominated by this very negative mother complex. This is ground to perhaps also link us to talk about the persona, what Jung is called the persona. Mm -hmm. Because the anima, the animus, mm -hmm. the shadow are yeah. somehow unconscious until we meet them yeah. in our dreams. Yeah, yeah. But our persona, Jung says, is the mask we put to cope with society, mm -hmm. to cope with the outer world. Yeah, yeah. And so this mask, uh, the, the persona, is our social face, in a way. Uh, the kind we deal as with the outer world as soon as we are in contact with it. So this is also our professional face. Uh, as a Jungian analyst, we behave a little bit different than, for example, a priest or a pastor. They also be behave different, the pastor and the priest, uh, collectively seen, um, or like a lawyer, it's a very different kind of persona. And uh, so it's very important to have a persona, to be perceived as trustful, because we uh, can't change our persona uh, and, and show ourselves one day like this and another day totally different because then we are not trustful yeah, in our attitudes and uh, kind of thinking and saying but there is also a danger that people can become too rigid in their persona and then they stuck in the persona and lose the contact to their real life, to the real self. Uh, what means that they don't feel alive anymore, really. They perhaps fell into a depression. Uh, I have an example of a, a friend who was a pastor. And he had a very interesting dream. He was in a very bad state, had also conflicts with his wife. He was very unhappy. Uh, he was about 
between 50 and, and 60. He was a very talented uh, man on in the uh, bridges. His profession, yeah. Yeah, in his pro yeah, in his profession. But he felt more and more depressed. And I watched him and had the impression he's depressed because he was too strongly caught in a certain role of being a pastor. And then he told me privately, it was not my client, a dream that he stands in his kitchen, he is weeping, uh, he's together with his wife and his wife is standing there with a very apathic face and he is weeping and says to her, I'm so hungry, I'm so hungry, please give me something to eat. And she is standing there without taking contact to him, very apathic. And he begins to look in his cupboards, in the, in the cupboards in the kitchen, in the fridge there, everything is empty. He doesn't find anything to eat. And this is a very impressive image for having no more anything nourishment in this relationship and that he has and in himself of course the dream is his dream so his wife is an image in the dream is an image of his inner wife and of course then he have to ask what is my concrete relationship to the outer wife how Good is the nourishment between us. And I recommended him to make an analysis, to come in contact again with him, uh, to his resources, to find a vivid anima, a life full anima. Um, uh, so to come in contact not only with his personal unconscious, but also with his collective to find new resources also. When men, women, mm -hmm. go through a difficult time in their relationship with the partner, mm -hmm. like in this case, yeah. this is a case of a priest, a pastor, there's an ethic behind it. Many men uh, get busy in overworking, mm -hmm. some drink, yeah. some take drugs, yeah. some they spend all the time doing sport, yeah. some they find a lover. Yeah. The same could be for the woman. Mm -hmm. What is your suggestion from a psychoanalytical Jungian point of view mm -hmm. that is related again to look mm -hmm. for your anima, your animals? Mm -hmm. So, do you still link this question to the persona also? But also yes, but also to the anima, because on yeah. the surface you yeah. can have a man or a woman yeah. that is well adapted so to society. So when a man, like in my example, uh, performs a uh, too rigid anima, he at the same time is too far away from his anima, from his uh, uh, shadow figures, from his uh, male parts, uh, because they are in a certain kind of uh, anima and uh, person anima animus and shadow are in a certain um, uh, regards uh, in contrast can be in contrast to persona because the persona tries to hide all kinds of shadows you want to be good to seem a, a good analyst to seem a good uh, pastor or even a perfect pastor and so you try to hide your shadow parts even before yourself and so you lose your life the contact to your life and f f fall into a depression and when you fall into a depression you can try to yeah you begin to develop very often a kind of compulsiveness which helps you to deal with your duties but rigidity also. Huh? Rigidity? Yeah, rigidity, yeah, yeah. 
a lot of rigidity and this is not the good kind of persona of course we need a persona but when the persona is too rigid we don't feel the person through the persona and the person should be um, um, uh, seen or uh, you, you should be through the person that the person should be present the real person should be present through the persona and when this doesn't happen anymore the person uh, this is, is, uh, indicates that the person lost the contact to her own roots, to her own um, emotional side. And so they try sometimes, such people try to help themselves by working more and more, so they can develop a kind of compulsiveness and addiction also. You can become a workaholic, sometimes it's combined with drinking whiskey already in the morning to help yourself to, to create uh, energy which you don't have when you don't uh, be in a good contact with your emotions. Uh, where is the whole life and the strength for life you need? When you are no more in contact, be, uh, you can begin to help yourself by drinking alcohol. Like a certain manager I met in a clinic who had a breakdown, a very talented man, but he uh, was very far away during his life more and more from being in contact with his emotions. He also was divorced, he didn't have a partner anymore. He had a son, but an adult son, but he wasn't in a contact with females. He only worked. He worked very hard and was very good in his job, but nobody did see that he was a very severe alcoholic uh, he began to drink whiskey um, already in the morning and he drank a whole bottle during the day, every day. He was a very severe alcoholic. And he then was found by his son uh, with a Korsakoff syndrome. So he had a damaged brain for the rest of his life. Uh, it was a very sad story. When this man would have found another mean, for example, Jungian analysis, you, he, he would have found himself again and would, be, would have been a healthy man at the end and not a man who lost a part of his brain for the rest of his life. And this is a very sad story, but these things happen. And when a person, for example, only identifies with the career and to being the best and even better and more be better <laughs> and uh, lets all the, the natural needs behind him or her, then it, it doesn't work anymore. So they begin to take drugs very often, uh, very often cocaine, because this works better than alcohol. Sometimes it's a mixture. And then in the night they take uh, medicaments to help them to sleep and to relax. And so it's a kind of devil circle, sure. a devil circle. and. Yeah, when these persons find, uh, such people find uh, by themselves a way out, it, then they are very lucky. Sometimes they are forced by the family, when they are have a family, the, the wife wants a divorce because the, the man is never seen, she is no more in a relationship. 
and so they fell into crisis sometimes uh, or they are uh, they lose their job and they fall in this way in a crisis sometimes it, it needs a big crisis to detect that there are unseen and unlived parts hopefully yeah will bring to a development and not more depression yeah because many times yeah yeah people don't find the courage to stand up yeah or to read yeah to a therapist yeah for for help yeah. i remember and perhaps this is the way we can conclude our conversation i remember mm -hmm. when i it was in a very difficult moment when I was at Cambridge University mm -hmm. and I contacted someone I trusted, Dr. Mm -hmm. Albizati, who then became my analyst and he said to me, it's needed a lot of courage to sit in the patient chair, to make the first call and ask for help. Yes, yes. But, but it's needed or asked, mm -hmm. required, even much more courage to stay there. Mm -hmm. And to go through therapy, yeah. to look at your shadow, yeah, yeah. to let transformation happen, and it takes a long, long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's quite what's my experience also. Yeah. Thank you, Marlene. Yeah. It was a pleasure to be here and listen to you. Thank you very much. It was also a pleasure for me to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you.